welcome to LMR Live, an innovative talk show series produced by University of Mississippi Music Students and hosted by yours truly, singer and professor Nancy Mariah Balish. Today we kick off our fifth season from the Nutt Auditorium at the University of Mississippi. We remain committed to giving you the opportunity to interact with acclaimed artists in real time. We are making Oxford, Mississippi the portal for this kind of musical experience. We combine education and entertainment, and what do I call it? Edutainment. Let me hear you say it. Edutainment. That's right. I remain committed to showcasing Mississippi artists and bringing in artists from across the world to our great state of Mississippi. So whether you're here in the audience, the live audience, or watching at home, we want to hear from you. Post on Facebook, tweet at LiveMuseRaz, or chat on that YouTube chat feature. We are glad you're here with us to experience edutainment with the Living Music Resource. The music resource research revolution continues. Collaboration and community are two words that I really love. I believe that endeavors with new and sometimes unexpected educational partners lead to a more cohesive society and through the universal language of music, a rediscovery of humanity can occur. Last night, these things were accomplished here in Nutt Auditorium. Last night, Sade Thomas, along with the rising star fife and drum band, performed, and it was spectacular. Who was here? Who was here? Yes, lots of folks were here. And that event, and today, happened because of a collaboration between the Sarah Eisen Center for Women and Gender Studies, and I want to give a big thank you shout out to Teresa Starkey and all of the staff at the Sarah Eisen Center. Through our combined efforts, we are fostering human connection, education, empathy, and understanding. So I'm so thrilled they're an LMR partner. So let's get started. Today, I'm going to focus on legacy, I'm going to focus on Mississippi, I'm going to focus on personal perspectives, and going to per focus on the relevance of Mississippi folk music. We are diving into these topics today with our featured guest, Sade Thomas. So who is she? Who's Sade? She is a young, charismatic musician who plays the fife, the drums, and sings. And not only that, she makes her own fife. Am I the only one intrigued by this? <laughs> her endless talents are inspiring, and her personality is truly contagious. She is a North Mississippi woman who is carrying on the tradition of her grandfather, Otha Turner, the American fife and drum tradition, Blues tradition, hill country music tradition, help me welcome Sade Thomas. Lois, <laughs> how are you doing? Have a seat. <sighs> She's tiny, but this woman, oh my gosh, she, she illuminates the stage. She was all over the place last night. I'm just, I'm mesmerized how you so beautifully shift between fife to vocals to drum, back to fife, yes. back to vocals. It's seamless. It's amazing. It is amazing. <laughs> I agree. So first thing I want to know, what is your first recollection, your first musical experience? What do you remember as a child? Well, my mother, she um, has pictures of me walking around the house at nine months blowing a harmonica. So that's where it all started on a harmonica, and to this day, I have, haven't picked it up since. But I um, started playing a harmonica, and then I, my brother said I switched over to the drums, and when I hit the keyboard, I would hit the same wrong note every time, the same wrong note every time. So I guess I was just kind of born with the music. Born with the music? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. When you shared this last night, but I want to share it with folks here who maybe weren't with us, that when was your first connection made with the fife. When did you decide, I want to play that instrument? I was sitting on my grandfather, Otha Turner, his front porch, and he was sitting there playing the fife, playing with the fife, I actually have it today, and just sitting there, you know, making up songs as he always did. And I was like, I want to play that. Didn't know what it was, know what it was called, know nothing about music. And the type of man, he was, a, he was like, here, play it. It's like, really? Giving a six-year-old a fife to just play it? But me, I took it home, like I could really play it. Took it home, practice and practice, didn't get any better, but I didn't tell my granddad. 
and I did my first performance at his goat picnic that he have every year, and to this day we still have it, the annual goat picnic, and he stopped the crowd. I was in the center of dust and dirt and sweaty men and women dancing everywhere, and he stopped the crowd, stopped the drummers, and I got out there and did my thing. And I don't know what I was doing at the time, but in his eyes, I was the best fight player there. Wow, <laughs> how did that make you feel? It made me feel, it's unex it, I can't explain the feeling, but at that time, I was like, man, I can do anything I wanna do as long as I got my granddad's support. And that's why, I, I guess, it kinda just forced me to whatever I wanted to do. He was like, right there, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. So I guess that's why I'm like I am today. If I want to do something, I was like, oh, I can do it, you know. Nothing make a fade but a try. That's what he always say. You don't know what you can do until you try it. I love that. And I'm sure you just have that voice in your head saying that yes, to you. Yes, back and forth, back, back and forth. What a good mantra to have going on in there. Yes, ma'am. So how do you make that instrument? And did your grandfather teach you how to do that aspect also? Well, I can't tell you how to make it, but he did not teach me how to make it. He did it. not. <laughs> I actually um, watched a video of him making it, and um, we never had that sit-down conversation one-on-one, -on -one, how to make a fife. But I'm glad that I learned it because right after he passed, my fife broke, and this is his fife. So. And I'm gonna pause right. Last night, before she came on the stage, she hands it to me. I was like, oh my gosh, if I drop this thing, if I break it, I mean, like, it's Bleh! in your hands. It's in my hands. Yes. I felt the pressure. I felt the pressure. But I just, I was just breathing. Hold this thing. All right. <laughs> I felt very important there briefly. Yes. Um, so, would you play a little something for us? Sure. So awesome. So a question from Faith. Many musicians have a special image or memory that they think of when performing the music that they love. Do you have any image or memory that just always comes to the front of your mind when you're playing? Um, the first time I led the band onto the stage it was in Ohio. And my grandfather was living at the time, and he played a trick on me. He was like, um, I'm going to have to let you lead the band onto the stage tonight. I'm sick. I was like, sick? Now, I was like 10 at the time. And I was like, OK, because I, when I went with my grandfather, I just played the, the djembe. You know, I did a little singing, but I never played the fight. And my Aunt Bernice, she was like, oh, yeah, girl, you can do it. I was like, no, I can't. So um, <laughs> I had my overalls on with my cowboy boots. And I was like, I'm going to lead this band down to the stage. And I came down. It was just like this, but bigger in Ohio. And I remember when the doors popped open, everybody was just sitting there looking, like, this is not Otha, who is this? So I walked on out, I was shaking, I could barely move, and I finally got on the stage, and he come back off behind the stage, and was like, yeah, I knew you could do it. I'm like, really? So at that point, he just kind of, he taught me something, because, you know, um, basically he wasn't going to be around all the time, so I had to learn how to lead the band onto the stage and take control just like that. And at that young age, I did it, even though I didn't want to do it, and I was nervous, and still get nervous to this day, but I did it. Well, we're glad you did, <laughs> that's for sure. Question from Hadassah. When you decided to learn how to play from your grandfather, what did your other family members say about that? Did they think it was strange? Were they indifferent? Because you were the one that really wanted to, was truly interested, right? Yes. And this is a big family. Yes, it is. Um, they were, I would guess, not jealous, but was like, out of all the grandkids, why her? You know, I was thinking the same thing. Out of all the grandkids, why me? You know, but um, my biggest supporter was my mom. She was there 100% and still to this day. But um, it's like my aunts and cousins, they always have like, why it couldn't be, you know, my child or, but. The way I look at it was for you, it's for you, you know? Right. You know, so maybe I think I look at it as I was the chosen one. He knew that I could be the one to take it to the next level if something happens to him. He saw that in you. Yes. Even when you didn't. Right. That's pretty neat. <laughs> um, so 
uh, Chanel wanted to know, what do you hope to achieve by continuing Otha Turner's legacy? I mean, what, what's on your mind when you're carrying this on? Because it's a huge legacy yes. that you are continuing. It is. I want it to be bigger than what it is now. I want to um, leave a mark, you know, like he did. He left a mark when he passed. And when I finally decide to drop, or if I do decide to drop, I want to leave a mark. You know, I want the whole world to know about Sade Thomas and the Rising Star Fife and Drum Band in a positive way. You know, I want our music on movies and win Grammys and Oscars, and I want the name to continue to live on. I like that. I like that. Do you have a specific audience in mind that you're trying to target, or is it just open? Well, right now we were focusing on the younger generation because, you know, the older people, they know all about older and the blues, but 2017 we're trying to focus on this, the pop and hip hop, so that's why we got to keep it fresh, you know, keep the young crowd coming back for more. But if we just keep the old traditional and we're like, oh, I don't want to hear that, you know, it's right. too slow, so we got to keep it up tempo to attract their audience. Yeah, and actually, I think it was Ava wanted to know how do you attract that younger audience? How do you draw them in? Um, well, me being a young person, I like to listen to different type of music, so I just called my drummers like, hey, y'all, we need to do this song. Like last night, we did X's and O's. This is my favorite song. I loved it. Who loved it? <laughs> loved it. What Thank I you. loved about it, and I said the same word as you did not, Chris. I said it was raw. <laughs> and I, I, when, she did, when she did the song, I mean, we're so used to the pop culture yes. where everything is so enhanced right. and so digitally, I don't know, <laughs> modified. And I'm sitting there, and I, and I was loving watching everyone in the house because everyone just started moving. Right. And little kids, I mean, nine were singing they along with you. <laughs> College kids, Yasmin, I saw you singing along. People were joining in, and it was just, but it was so real, raw, yes. exposed, and gorgeous. Right. I mean, it Thank was just you. fantastic. Thank so you. I think you're hitting a nail on the head there. That's right. What you're doing there. Yeah. So pulling in that kind of repertoire and putting your mark on it. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yes, like definitely. That. Um, so Melanie wants to know, and I want to keep going back to Grandpa here. Okay. Can't help it, though. Um, what's your favorite memory of playing with him? Playing with him? As I say, I never did the fife with him, but um, I did a show playing the Jim Bay, and I think it was in Oxford. Hmm. It was like a, um, it was like an outdoor party or something, and I wanted to play every instrument on the stage for some reason. I went from the trap set, the drum set, to singing a song and playing the keyboard, and I played the Jim Bay. And when I got on the gym bay, my grandfather was the type of man that could hold a song for 10 minutes. That's a long time. And when I played, he was like, all right, let's get it. We started playing. And I would never forget, I have the picture at home. I was looking up like, Lord, please let him end this song. <laughs> and they took the picture just like that. But um, I think that was the last time we actually played together. Wow. And it was amazing. Even though the song was long, but I enjoyed it. That's pretty neat. It was pretty neat. Um, I want to bring out someone else to join us on this stage, okay. someone who's going to add another level to this conversation. I mean, you're able to give such yes. I mean, exquisite personal perspective. I want to bring out someone who's going to give us a little more of the research side here of things. I want to bring out Scott Beretta, who is a writer, researcher, UM faculty member, a recipient of the Mississippi Arts Commission's 2016 Governor's Award for Excellence in the Arts for Mississippi Heritage. He has been a Mississippian since 1988. Am I right with that? 99. Whoa, okay. <laughs> I'll take 90. All right. <laughs> and he works with the Living Blues and the radio show Highway 61 and part of the team that created the Mississippi Blues Trail, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Let's give a warm Ole Miss welcome to Scott Beretta. <laughs> Something I'm noticing, those who know me, I move rather quickly. Do you notice both of these, these blues musicians, and I teased my colleague Ricky about this too, they move so calmly. I need to, I need to take in some of this, this calm, this calm. So how are you, Scott? I'm doing great. I can't believe you and I have not crossed paths, but this is just the beginning, man. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to see this. I was just commenting on how great it is to see this kind of music, uh, my kind of music, addressed here in the music department. You know, I, th I think of it more as like chorale and classical music, and maybe I don't have a very good understanding of what you all do here, but seeing that avant-garde jazz band and, and seeing one of my favorite people and musicians here is just wonderful. Well, thank you. Try to shake it up a bit. I think it's important, and you and I were talking about this before the show, creating these bridges and realizing you know, we're all in this musical world together. What can we learn from one another and what can we share? And I'm gonna pull something. When you and I had coffee this morning, mm -hmm. I asked her specifically about, do you, do you feel you have to be from a certain area to successfully pull this music off? Or are, uh, you know, what do you, how prescriptive is it? And you said you're open to anyone yes. doing this type of music, yes. which I think is, mm. is a great thing. Yes. I think being inclusive. So, Scott. How do you categorize this type of music? Oh, how do, well, it's, a, it's a, one of the oldest continuing uh, musical traditions here in Mississippi. We usually talk about it as a pre-blues form, right? And we, when we talk about the blues, which originated around 1900 or something like that, we're not exactly sure when, but not, not much longer than uh, uh, before that. But the, the fife and drum music, uh, we also are a little uncertain exactly when it began or when this particular style of North Mississippi fife and drum uh, music began, but probably in the latter 1800s. And then a lot of people, ethnomusicologists, uh, address how the music, not just to the fife and drum, but the music in this area has a lot of uh, affinities or similarities with some of the music of West Africa. So it's not to say that it's African music precisely, because that's a process that goes, that exchanges hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. But North Mississippi, and particularly Panola and uh, Tate counties, are identified by many uh, musicologists or ethnomusicologists as this really rich uh, region. And so, uh, you know, in addition to the fife and drum, used to have um, uh, uh, string bands playing in that area and all, all sorts of stuff. Neat, yeah. neat. Um, Caitlin Richardson wanted to know, and touch us a little bit, but how would you describe, and either of you chime in, how would you describe the difference between Delta Blues and other types of blues? Most people talk about an, a, a focus on the groove, I think, right? Yeah. If you, you see, you've seen my our film on, on uh, Fred McDowell yes. and, we, and Luther Dickinson actually talks about the similarities between um, the guitar music or guitar-based music of Fred McDowell yeah, and Otha Turner, who was Fred McDowell's best mm -hmm. friend. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily see what the connection is between this more guitar-oriented music and the drum music, but you, you probably think about it a lot, don't you? I do. It's, um, <laughs> like when we play together, it's very similar, you know, um, with the guitar and the, the drums, it's like, hey, it's the same. You know, but people think it's different, but it's all the same. It's all the same. Yeah, and well, you play piano too, don't you? So you. I play a little piano. You know chords, though, right? <laughs> yeah. no, because you we play... didn't hear that yet. <laughs> right? We're gonna have to wheel that piano back out. And we'll right. go. Uh -oh. She also admitted she played the flute last night too. So I have a flute on hand also. No, I'm kidding. Um, Logan wanted to know how much of the style of your grandfather's music do you think expresses Mississippi blues music? and the effect it has had on the music worldwide. Mm. Well, it affects it because um, most of it is so unique. And when you hear it, you just automatically think about Mississippi, Hill Country, like he was saying about Hill Country Blues. You, you automatically think about it. And um, it affects throughout the world because so much is like the war times. It connects with the war and World War II's and all of that. It's, it's a connection. But the way, at one point, it was kind of, you know, separating. You know, we didn't have that, that traditional connection like we did when he was playing. Mm -hmm. But that's what we're trying to get back to. You know, we're trying to get back to that, that war style. But I was, like I was telling you, but keep that up funky beat with it, you know. So I guess that's how it makes that connection worldwide. Worldwide. And you do travel. Yes, ma'am. All over the globe. Yes, ma'am. Favorite place you've been? I would have to say Paris. Paris? Yes. Why? 
Well, I'm, I wanted it's to Paris. see it. Yeah, it's Paris. Of course it's Paris. <laughs> but um, I wanted, when I got the phone call, the only thing that was on my mind was seeing the tower. I wouldn't worry about the show or nothing. I was like, okay, can I see the tower? It's like, you don't know what, you don't want to know where you're playing at? No, not really. Just take me to the tower. <laughs> Just take me to the tower. I like it. And you guys run into each other different places. You recently met up in L.A., right? Yes, at the we, airport. We, yeah. <laughs> we actually met uh, at the uh, Memphis airport about three weeks ago. Yes. And uh, I knew that she was performing the next night, playing the drums behind R.L. Boyce from Como, who's a great yes. guitar player and who was a longtime drummer for, yes. for Otha Turner. Uh, and I was, I was overjoyed to see her. And then she told me, well, we're playing this private show today at noon. And so I'm like, yeah. well, get me in. Came over. <laughs> Came right over. <laughs> we played on the, at the top floor of an office building yes. right off of Sunset Strip. So so, or pretty. she played. She's so me. pretty. It was wonderful. Yes, I enjoyed those was. photos. Oh, I, I, I enjoyed, enjoyed taking them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to bring someone else out to join us. Uh, I want to bring out a colleague here, Ricky Burkhead. He is a music professor and director of percussion studies here at the university. And he's been here since 1994. Is my date right, Ricky? All right, good, good. Um, Ricky attended and first taught at a historically black college and university, Mississippi Valley State University. The rich tradition of drumming preserved by the Rising Star Fife and Drum Band is also a tradition upheld by the drum lines at these universities. He has published compositions for drum lines in this style, and actually on the University of Mississippi Percussion Ensemble CD, there are three pieces in this style. Um, help me welcome one of my favorite people, Ricky Burkhead. Keep in that pace. <laughs> Welcome. Come have a seat. How you doing? So Ricky, the main reason I want this man up here, and it ties to what, what Scott said earlier about what we do here, I think Ricky is the perfect person to really address how this subject matter, how this genre ties to things we're doing in this department. Okay, I'd like to first say that uh, when I grew up in Greenwood, Mississippi, in the Delta, uh, there was a lot of drummers in my neighborhood, and we played what we call, I call them now, global rhythms, which is rhythms that you would hear the Rising Star Drum and Fife Band play. That just came natural to play. So we would get branches and play those things on uh, boxes, and um, from that, when we got drums, we began to like form little drum groups. And we saw groups like uh, Jackson State and Arl Cohen, uh, historically black college bands that played those rhythms that they had inherited from some of the African roots. Uh, what's important about what Rising Star Fife and Drum Group do is that they're from North Mississippi. So this is North Mississippi Hill Country music. This is our region. So for Sade and all the guys that play with you to preserve that is super important for Ole Miss, especially us having the Blues Archives here and the fact that we have her on the show today to highlight this to this audience here and also when this goes out to the general public. Yeah, thank you, thank you. You brought a little toy with you today, did you not? I did. <laughs> Want to share it with us maybe? I do, and I'll tell you briefly about this, uh, that uh, drumming fife that you see here in Mississippi with Sade and their group uh, originated from uh, war times, like the 18th century, which is the 1700s, the Revolutionary Wars, there were blacks in those bands, although there weren't as many blacks in the country, except for slaves, they were allowed to play in those bands. Thomas Jefferson allowed his slaves to have their own drum and fife band. And so after the war, after the emancipation, blacks were allowed to drum. Before that, no drumming. So when they came from Africa, no drumming, just in case they communicated and uh, to start any kind of uprising with the communication they would have. So after that, they began to play drum and fife music. And I'm gonna play uh, three short excerpts from, two from the uh, Revolutionary War and one from World War II uh, that uh, shows that style on a rope drum. And this would be the type drum that they used when they did drum and fife back at the time. Awesome. Yes. Let me hold that for you? Oh, God. <laughs> See, I picked a good person. He brings his, he brings toys. He's gonna, yeah. he's gonna enlighten us. Okay. 
that for sure. So the first, the first is called Three Camps. Back in Revolutionary War times, there was no electronic communication. So when groups were out in the field, you couldn't put all the soldiers in one place. So they would camp out like a mile away from one another. So at nighttime, to make sure everything's OK in each camp, the first camp would have a, a drummer and a fife player to play a theme. And then the second camp in the middle would play a, a no, another theme that could be heard by the first camp and the third camp. And then the third camp, in turn, would play a theme that the second camp heard and then went back to the first camp to let everybody know that everything was okay. So this is three camps. So each theme represented a different camp. So it would, they would play those out to signal to the next camp everything's OK. Now, I'll keep these other two short. The next is called Connecticut Halftime. It was Revolutionary War time, so from the state of Connecticut. And then the last one would be the downfall of Paris. You know, Paris fell to the Germans back in World War II. And so when the Germans marched through and they played, uh, this is one of the themes that were played by one of the military bands. I think a good sweat segue from this is to talk about these picnics that take place and um, sort of the, the call of the drum to start the picnic, correct? Yes. All three of you have been to one of these picnics, correct? Yes? Yes. yes. I'm the only outsider here. I gotta come. <laughs> I'm coming this year. Thank Watch you. out. Make sure. <laughs> Next year. Yes. Next year. Um, <laughs> share a little bit about the experience of the picnic for those who have not been? Um, the experience, I would say, um, first of all, when you do come, do not wear your best shoes. Um, <laughs> it normally gets pretty dusty, but um, not to scare you away, you will hear live bands and the fife and drum kicks the picnic off. You know, um, when my granddad was living here, I always say, all right, we need to play these drums, because you know they can hear them all the way down there to the stove, so when they start playing, everybody gonna come to the picnic. So we would start out uh, with the fife and drum song, and never fails, you know, people would start rolling in, and then we'd move to a live band, and the fife and drum normally play in between each set, and it's known for his barbecue goat. You know, um, back in the day, he had a farm, so he, that's where he got all his meat from. He got his pork and his goat, and that's how he provided for his family, by having the goat picnic. And people from all around the world come to the picnic for this famous barbecue goat. And for a minute, I did not eat it because I knew what it was. But um, I actually tried it this year, and I must say For the first time? For the first time. Oh, my God. And it is pretty good. I've been missing out all these years. But I don't think I'm going to try it next year. I just, you know. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but it is actually good, so um, hopefully. Next year, you all get a chance to come out to the picnic. And we did a little field trip. Yes, yes. Don't you think? Yes. Would you we, join me? Would you go? I'm seeing some yeses. Yes, some yes, yes. yes. Um, your experience at, the, at a, one of the picnics. 
it was it was it blew my mind the first time. I mean, now I pretty much know what to expect. Though one of the uh, fun things about it is the kind of chaotic aspect of it, particularly as it gets darker. Uh, you usually start sometime in the afternoon, and then it's really just a big neighborhood party. I mean, there's the locus of it. I mean, for a lot of people from outside, go there and then want to see the performances. Mm -hmm. But I'd say the majority of the crowd is. Lined up a, around, <laughs> what, along what maybe a mile of the road and yes. drinking beer and listening to the music. Of course, the music travels really far. Yes, but, it does. Yeah. Ricky, have you been to one? I've only seen it on, in documentary films. All right, all right. Well, then you and I are going together. <laughs> That's right. All right. <laughs> um, all right. We are going. I want to talk about the Mississippi Blues Trail. Scott, what? What was the big thing that, that drew you to take on such a huge project? And it is really enormous and significant. Yeah, we're actually celebrating our 200th uh, marker this November. I can't remember the exact date, but it'll be in Clarksdale. And, um, but 200, we started in December of 2006. And at that point, we had a grant to put up Ten markers in five adjacent counties in the Delta mm -hmm. uh, it quickly spread. We de decided to put up. We made a list of 120 markers, and then it has just continued to grow. And of course, this is our bicentennial in Mississippi, and so we've kind of rushed the schedule <laughs> to try to make sure that before December we get in 200 markers. And it'll celebrate the song uh, "Rocket 88," which was a, a 1951 hit, big hit on. Um, Chess Records out of Chicago uh, by Jackie Brinston and the Delta Cats, which was actually uh, Ike Turner's group out of uh, Clarksdale. And sometimes it's called the first rock and roll record. So we wanted to celebrate with a bang. But um, I got involved in it. I was actually involved already in the B.B. King, King Museum in Indianola, which we started around 2004. And one of the reasons why we've been doing the Blues Trail is not just to celebrate the rich musical traditions of the state, uh, but also it's an economic driver, right, that we want to bring more tourists to the state. And so the Blues Trail serves as kind of an infrastructure for tourism. There's mm -hmm. 200 places to stop, including uh, downtown Como, yes. right? Uh, I'm sure you played, I remember, yes, playing down did. the street when we put up a market. Awesome. Marker for Otha Turner and also yes. for Napoleon Strickland, who, who played in that same tradition. Neat. Well, time with this, we always play a game on LMR Live. So we are going to tie this game to the Mississippi Blues Trail. But guess who's playing the game today? All of you. We are going to be calling upon the audience to see how much you know about the Mississippi Blues Trail. We're going to be playing Two Truths and a Lie Mississippi Blues Trail mm. version. So let's segue into our game. All right, so I want to say, feel free to interject at any point, especially if they're struggling, but I want to hear all of you see what we know. So we are on the Mississippi Blues Trail. First stop is going to be with Big Jack Johnson. All right, so we've got three items on the board. We have one, was he one of 18 children? Number two, nicknamed the Waterman or father to 13 children, who thinks they know the lie? Are you going to be shy? Seriously? <laughs> Seriously? Come on, take a guess. C. 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 So we think it's that the, the lie is he was father to 13 children? Yes. Let's take a look. Is that correct? Boom. That is actually true. No, 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 no. That's actually true. Another guess. Another guess. B, nicknamed the Waterman, let us see. You got it right, that is the lie. Very good. So, what does it say there? He was actually the oil man, yes? 
cool, I mean. Yes. <laughs> They're just like, uh-huh. Uh -huh. He got drove it. an oil <laughs> truck. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's move on. A name we all know, B.B. King. All right, number one was one of the three kings of the blues guitar. Number two, performed 463 concerts in 1956, or real name was Riley B. King. Who thinks they know the lot? A, we think it's A. Let's try it. It's actually true, actually true. See, we're learning things today. We need to know this stuff, right? That's right. C, okay, let's try C. No, that one is also true, so let's go with B. Mm. It's actually a lie. He actually performed 342 concerts, which I love how it says on the board. Faith Janicki put this game together, brilliant. And it says, still quite a lot, I agree. Yeah. Can you imagine doing that many concerts? How many concerts do you do a year? <laughs> I don't know. You don't count, because it would be overwhelming. Yes, but I'm pretty busy, so I have to manage school and work in true. between those concerts. So. True, 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 true. All right, let's move on to the McCoy brothers, Joe and Charlie McCoy. Are we feeling a little shyer? Are we feeling braver? I see bravery over here from Amanda and Robert. Oh, no, they just got serious. <laughs> All right, first up, Jessica Rabbit covered a Joe McCoy piece. Second, Charlie McCoy met President Theodore Roosevelt. Or three, both performed outside of the band Harlem Hamfats. I have an A and I have a C. C is pretty loud. We're going to go with C. It's actually true. It's actually true. I expect you to use these in conversation now when you're out and about, right? This is just going to be random facts. Give me another one. Are we going with A? A. Actually, true. What? Google it, because it's really cool. And we'll go with B. For some reason, we're, our lies are falling in B here. I don't know. <laughs> so he did not meet President Theodore Roosevelt. Moving on, Bo Diddley. I wish I had a cool name like that. Bo Diddley. Bo Diddley. Just floats, off, floats right <laughs> off the tongue. All right, first off, did Bo Diddley, we have had a rectangular guitar? studied trombone and violin, or played a diddly bow? Which is the lie? <laughs> C, whoa, well, they, 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 there's just an uproar. Let's go with C. You got it right! <laughs> Yay, give yourself a hand! Just for that great response and for getting it right, I'm throwing a cup, catch it. Someone gets it, all right. <laughs> No one was injured, right? Let's get some real good right. ones, right? <laughs> All some right, we got it right. So, there really is an instrument with this name, but that's not how he got his name. Moving on to Muddy Waters. Muddy Waters grew up in Clarkdale, Mississippi, wrote the hit song Maybelline, or helped spread blues to Europe. What do we think? A, we're going with A, grew up in Clarksdale. That is actually true. We're going with B? B, please. That is the lie. That is like actually, make sure I'm right on this, he, Muddy Waters, helped Chuck Berry get his recording contract, correct? Trust, and trust had, records. Yeah. And it had yeah, a different trust. name and didn't Muddy Waters suggest the title Maybelline. Mm -hmm. So pretty cool. You all did pretty good. You don't get a cup on that one, though, but give yourself a hand. <laughs> all right. So, so as we're with this music, so a student asked this question. I'm just, I can't remember who it was, but it was curious. It seems at these picnics or at these concerts, something you're doing really well is getting a very diverse group of people coming in to check out this music. I mean, it's all ages, different locales. I mean, you're traveling around the world. How, why, is, why are people drawn in? How are you able to pull that off with this music? Well, for once, I think they want to see what this small girl can do. You know, because basically when they hear, like, or see me online, they want to know, what can she do? You know, they don't know what to expect from a fife and drum concert. You know, mm -hmm. if it's your first time hearing about a fife, you know, you're going to go and check it out and see what they're all about. 
and the first impression is that's that's going to be it. If you do a great show the first time, if you blow it off, then they're not going to come back and see you. So we always try to make a good impression. If you, it's your first time, we're going to try to pull you in so you can be a new fan. Got it. What do you guys think? <laughs> I think it's a sense of community. I'm going to say what yeah, I, think. I think. Even so. when you're describing the idea of, you know, a call and then people coming together to have an experience. And I think that's personally mm -hmm. something that we as a society are needing more and more today mm -hmm. um, because we, even though it's so easy to communicate with one another, I feel we end up more isolated than ever. And the energy when you're with other people experiencing something, whether that's music or art or whatever that may be, just even a conversation like today. I mean, the fact right. that you're here experiencing their energy, you can't get that digitally. So I think this idea it's just so exciting mm -hmm. to think the call of the music coming out. Let's embark on this together. And I'm going to go on a limb here. It seems like there's less rules, yes. too. That it's <laughs> come and be, come and experience, and let's see what happens. And I think that's yeah. incredibly refreshing and needed today. Mm -hmm. Am I crazy? No. no, I think a lot of people come to Mississippi. A lot of people talk about the authenticity of the experience here. And uh, even when you go there to O.B. McClinton Road, I think that's pretty authentic there. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you go out in the country and it's, it's something that you can't experience in California right. or Connecticut or Belgium. There's people coming from all over the world because you just can't replicate it. I mean, mm -hmm. you play in other places, but you can't replicate that whole yes. sense of what the picnic is like in particular. Mm -hmm. And also coming here to Ole Miss, I have a greater appreciation for blues and North Mississippi Hill Country music, drum and fife. I grew up in the Delta where there was like a juke joint on every corner. And you heard that all the time, and with a lot of musicians around, and you sort of took it for granted, but now you come to a place like this, and when a lot of those guys are gone, and some of that music is fading, and it's preserved with the blues markers and the rich, rich history here, I really appreciate it more. And uh, I like to say about, about Sade, uh, last night was the first time I heard you do a, a full concert. I've heard you on, pro, on concerts where you had like 15 minutes or something like that. But you're an amazing fife player. Thank like, you. Really, really good. Amazing. Thank you. And your djembe playing is really good, too. I was <laughs> impressed you. with that. Yeah. So really appreciate what you do. Thank you. Absolutely. Give her a hand. Thanks. So if you were to dream big, what, what, what's, like, what's the next thing you're hoping is going to happen in your, the trajectory of your career, Charday? That I win that Grammy. I like that idea. Yes. I'm I like so that close. idea. <laughs> Win that Grammy. Yes, yes. But we got a lot of hard work to do. Well, I think that's the other thing people don't realize sometimes. I mean, this room realizes because you've got so many musicians in this room right. who understand the amount of work and effort and practice and mm -hmm. hours that go into it. So you're in great company with that. We all understand that. But a lot of people don't realize we're just coming. They think it just happens. And parts of it do. Yes. But it still also takes great effort and time. Right. They just want to show up and hope they have a great show. That's right. Without, as they should as the audience, right? Yeah, but without doing the work that it takes to have a great show. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yes. All right. So I want to thank a few people. Um, actually, a lot of people. I want to thank the Yakna Batafa Arts Council. I want to thank the University of Mississippi Music Department, the Sarah Eisen Center for Women and Gender Studies, the Inn at Old Miss, and the Dream Team. The Dream Team are students who are working hard, honing skills outside of the classroom to help make them ready for a career in this 21st century world of music. And I wanted, they can't come up here and be seen because they're doing incredible jobs. They're all at their stations. But we have Faith as lead camera operator, Melanie as our live stream technician, Lacey and Ava working as sound technicians, Hadassah as our social media coordinator, Jocelyn, visual coordinator, and J Jane Ann, our journalism intern. Please give these students a big hand. I also want to thank my colleague, Michael Worthy. Those watching on the live stream didn't get to experience this, but we had a little house band to get us in the mood today. And we're going to start doing this before our live streams, <laughs> whatever we're doing. So whether it's blues, whether it's opera, whatever it may be, there's going to be some music getting us, getting the flavor. Yes. So um, please plan to join us in our new home base. Nut is now our home. And plan to join us here in person or via the web on Tuesday, October 24th 
for another LMR Live, and come back on Friday, October 27th for a concert. Both of these events are also in collaboration with the Sarah Isom Center, and we'll be featuring our very own Price Walden. So very excited about that. The other thing I'm announcing today, we are launching, my colleague Amanda Johnson and I are launching a new institute here at the University of Mississippi. It is called the Living Music Institute, and it will take place for the first time this January. It'll be a four-day intensive ARIA preparation program, and we're putting out a call. This is going to go live tomorrow where you can start applying. We are looking for undergraduate students from wherever to come to this great institution to get intense work with UM faculty from music, from theater, and we're also bringing in Metropolitan Opera star and La Scala Opera star Callan Asperian to work with our singers. They will perform an aria night. They will also compete in a competition for a chance for a monetary prize and to be featured with the LOU Symphony Orchestra at the Ford Center with Maestro Selim Garay. And guess what? It only costs. $300, includes housing and some meals. Is that a bargain or what? That's lame, is that a bargain? And there are full scholarships available. So I'm hoping we're, they're just gonna, the applicants are just gonna be unleashed starting tomorrow. So please check that out. So exciting, we keep growing, we keep expanding. Great things are happening at the University of Mississippi. So anything I didn't ask any of you that you feel like you gotta get in here? They're so chill. I love it. I love it. I joke with Ricky sometimes. I'm like, I say to Ricky, what would Ricky do? What would Ricky do? Well, then let me say the most important thank you here at the end. I would like to thank these three people for, I mean, Scott, you just got off a plane, right? Yes, I did. Literally. Woke up at the, before the chickens this morning or That's something right. to get here. Uh -huh. And Ricky, you're a busy man performing all over. Made time for us. Charday, you could have left last night and you stayed. You kept your cohort here, I appreciate it. So <laughs> we wanna thank you guys for being here, sharing some of this information. I hope it's planted a seed that you wanna go and you wanna find out more about them, about what they're doing, and go out. Experience some of these things in person, all right? So let's thank them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The music research revolution continues! <laughs>